Finally tonight, Jeffrey Brown has the latest installment in our monthly book group. Now read this. It's a road trip into the past about settling a continent and creating a nation and to the future of America's role in the world. Earning the Rockies has been our September book, and it stirred quite a bit of discussion and debate among readers. Author Robert Kaplan is here to answer some of the questions you sent in, and welcome, and thanks for participating. It's a great pleasure for me to be here, Jeff. Good. Let's go. I want to go right to the first question because okay. it helps set up what you were after. Very good. Okay. Why did you choose to frame your argument in terms, in the form of a memoir and a road trip? So this is memoir, road trip, policy. Yeah. It's a, I've never done a book like this. It's an mm -hmm. odd way to organize it. The first part is a memoir about my father who inspired me to travel because he spent the 1930s traveling in 43 of the lower 48 states. Mm -hmm. The second chapter is about a great forgotten American writer, Bernard DeVoto, mm -hmm. who traveled all over the country, wrote all about the settling of the West. But though he was a continentalist, he believed in America's international destiny in World War II. And putting DeVoto together with my father yeah. made me want to take my own road trip. So you did. Right. So I did. And then the next two chapters were about traveling literally from New England to San Diego. And what I do there is reflect on everything I've seen along the way and try to understand what it means for America's role in the world. Through geography. Through because geography. Because that's to let in those who... In other words, yeah. it's, a, it's a geographical landscape meditation followed by a geopolitical analysis, which you never see anywhere else mm -hmm. because it's like two separate subcultures, two separate audiences. So I think it was jarring to people, but it was the only way that I could do it because I believe foreign policy emanates from a country's domestic condition. And the, and the country's destiny right. in some way. And that could only be shown through a road trip which emphasizes geography. Okay, so I said it stirred up a lot of discussion and debate. I want to go to the next question. I struggled with your support of the principle of manifest destiny. My question is, aren't there other ways to achieve greatness? Or is greatness really the goal we should be trying to achieve? So there were a number of questions along those lines. I want to read one other one that came in from Gary Getson. Would the U.S. have made a much better impact on the world if it had not decimated Native Americans and their culture? There's this constant tension yes. that you and refer to. Right, because, manif because as I say at the beginning of the book, um, American history is morally unresolvable. And it's unresolvable because the conquest of the West and the decimation of the, of the Native Americans led, for a di led to a, a middle-class machine society across the whole temperate zone of North America with all of its resources, more navigable inland waterways than the rest of the world combined, masses of petroleum, of, you know, of other things. And with that capacity, America was able to save the world in two world wars and the Cold War that followed. Did one thing make the other, justify the other thing? No. That's why it's morally unresolvable. And that's what a lot of and people I are... Str and yeah. I struggled with it myself. And I see readers struggling with right. it. Right, yeah. yeah. Okay, another, I want to go to the next question because it represents another strain of the discussion here. Let's take a look. You write about the growing divide between city-states and rural areas and cities that have not adjusted to the global economy. Do you have any thoughts about how to bridge this growing divide? It was stunning what I saw. Outside of the two coasts, outside of the university towns and college towns, and outside of a few, a smattering of state capitals, which are doing very well, much of America are towns of 20, 30,000 people with shelled out storefronts, nobody on the main street, uh, people having lost all hope. Uh, this, this book was written and researched before the last election, before the campaign even began for the last election. Yeah. And I saw a heartland which was economically and socially devastated. And how does that play into it, what then and, followed and the then election? All I could think about is how to bridge the divide is we can't go backward, we can only go mm -hmm. forward. Because the only future is global. 
Um, you know, you have to get more of these places hooked into the global economy. Like I'm traveling along the Ohio River and I see one devastated town after another. But then I get to Marietta, Ohio, which is a tiny college, but it has students from dozens of countries. It's very highly rated and it's part of the global world. Suddenly I'm there and then I leave it again. Okay, let's go to one more question. Mr. Kaplan, you say in the book, Americans, I find more and more each day as I travel, do not want to know the details about foreign policy. Is this disconnect with foreign policy replicated around the world? Um, you do, we should say, you travel all over. You've written yes, about I many do. other parts of the world. Yeah, I've, I've reported from 100 countries. Mm -hmm. And in most, it's only, you only see it replicated in large, massive countries, continental size like the United States, where there's so much going on internally that the outside world seems almost to disappear in a way. But in many, you know, Europe is mainly small countries, and even the biggest countries are small by our standards. But in Europe, in Africa, and the Middle East, people are much more connected to world events, I find, uh, than in the United States. United States. It's, it's almost as if uh, you know intellectually that every place in the U.S., the Oklahoma panhandle has agricultural ties with cities mm -hmm. in China and everywhere. You know all this intellectually, but when you actually see it and drive, it, or drive across it, the continent is so big and variegated that the rest of the world seems abstract almost. All right, we'll leave it there. I want to thank everybody who wrote in questions. We'll continue with more of those questions online, which you can find on our Facebook page and NewsHour website. For now, Robert Kaplan, thank you very much. My pleasure. And let me announce our book club pick for October. It's a very different look at American lands, especially in the West. American Wolf by Nate Blakesley tells the story of what came to be known as the most famous wolf in the world in Yellowstone National Park and the people and politics around it. We hope you'll read along in Now Read This, our book club collaboration with the New York Times.